Hello, I am Isla Boyce from the University of California, San Diego, and I want to thank ABM for inviting me to give this brief but very important segment of what every physician needs to know, that is, speaking about the late preterm infant. I come from UC San Diego, where I work in the outpatient general pediatric offices, seeing babies, children, and their families and where I also teach medical students and pediatric residents. I founded the UCSD Premature Infant Nutrition Clinic 15 years ago, where we have seen over 1,300 infants and their mothers. The majority have been late preterm infants. 10% of all babies in the world are born preterm, that is less than 37 weeks. There is some variability in this figure depending on the country or the region of the world. The U.S. preterm rate has crept up a little over the last four years and is now at 10.5%. But most importantly, three quarters of all preterm births are in the 34th, 35th, and 36th weeks of gestation. Infants born during this three-week span are referred to as late preterm. I want to speak a minute about what we know about the inpatient experience of infants born during this period of time. Studies published in the past 20 years have reported an increased morbidity during the inpatient stay. This slide shows the results of three of many studies that show an increasing risk of morbidity for each lost week of gestation. For some morbidities, there is a doubling for each week. In the above chart, reading from right to left, each category, uh, prolonged hospitalization, need for oxygenation, phototherapy, IV fluids, incubator, NG feeds and sepsis workup, there is an increase in need for an intervention. And I find it quite remarkable that all three of these studies came to the some, same conclusion. That is, these infants are at an eight, seven to eight times greater risk for a morbidity as compared to a full-term infant. Now let's take a little closer look at the late preterm infant. They often have limited glycogen stores and body fat that increases their risk for hypoglycemia and or hypothermia. Delayed bilirubin metabolism increases the risk for hyperbilirubinemia. They may not wake for feeds and or just be poor feeders. The mothers of the late preterm infant are more likely to have medical issues that puts them at a risk for a, most, a low milk supply. And it kind of makes a perfect storm for problems. That is, a delay in the provision of nutrition can compound all of these vulnerabilities. But lastly, some infants born late preterm may appear robust, but don't be fooled. Some of them are great imposters, and they look like they're breastfeeding well, but in reality do not have the ability to effectively breastfeed in those first few days of life. Dr. Eidelman, in this issue of breastfeeding medicine, had the following to say about the late preterm infant. Simply routine, baby-friendly 10-step practices alone are insufficient to overcome the inherent problems of infants born at this gestational age. Special resources, both in hospital and post-discharge, must be allocated to meet the demands of this population so as to maximize their neurodevelopmental potential. So, how should the LPI be managed? Here I've listed five resources that I find useful. Let me spend a little more time on ABM protocol number 10. Uh, we organized the protocol around several principles uh, of care or principles of practice with the aim to prevent frequently encountered problems. I should mention the protocol is undergoing revision now, but these principles of practice will remain the same. A written policy with procedures specific to the care of the LPI is the first step. This policy should include enhanced assessment, such as enhanced vital sign assessment, steps to minimize separation of mother and infant whenever possible, enhanced and prompt lactation support, LPI-specific communication tools, education of all involved in the care of the infant and the mother, and discharge and follow-up guidelines. If uh, the LPI has an ineffective latch and suck and thus is not transferring sufficient milk from the breast, then we need to shift our approach. We must ensure adequate nutrition for the baby. That is likely going to mean supplementation. We must help the mother initiate and maintain a good milk supply with pumping while the baby is maturing and developing the strength, stamina, and coordination to breastfeed effectively. 
We also need to give the baby the opportunity to learn to breastfeed, and that means time at the breast. We call this approach triple feeds. I usually suggest that the infant breastfeed for a limited uh, period of time first, then supplement, and then the mother pump. However, sometimes the supplement can be given at the breast via a tube while the baby is breastfeeding, or one can finger feed or use a syringe or a cup as demonstrated in these photos. But for a more detailed discussion of supplementation, I refer you to ABM Protocol 3. My colleagues in the UCSD new newborn unit have graciously allowed me to share with you their little baby bundle for the LPI. Um, I go into this tool in a little more detail in the longer uh, talk that you may want to refer to. As you can see, uh, this policy is written for the 35 and 36 weekers as well as the low birth weight infant with the aim to keep the baby safe, warm, and fed to prevent problems. This bundle provides for enhanced procedures and orders for thermal regulation, lactation consultation, supplementation, and the identification and management of hypoglycemia. As you can see, the 34-week LPI is admitted to the NICU initially and transferred to the newborn unit if stable. Each newborn service needs to determine what works for their hospital. For us, the risks of morbidity in the first few hours of life um, is best managed in the NICU for that 34-weeker. This is hot off the press. It is a recently revised family education piece for the Little Baby Care Bundle that educates families and facilitates communication with the aim, again, to prevent problems. Keeping the LPI safe while providing uh, care and nutrition for optimal growth and development. The bundle also includes very specific discharge criteria that I have outlined here. The LPI is usually not a candidate for early discharge. So let's talk a little bit about what might happen after discharge. At the time of discharge, these babies are still vulnerable, and most are not at their due date, but closer to 36 weeks. Most problems with transition, except for bilirubin, are resolved, but except for feeding, which is, uh, and especially breastfeeding, remains a challenge. If it is not managed properly, they are at risk for serious medical morbidities, including readmission, usually for hyperbilirubinemia, and even kernicterus and or hypernatremic dehydration. But we can't forget mother's health as well and how she is managing. I show this slide as it is a dramatic demonstration of what being born preterm means at the organ level, in this case, the brain. As I just said, these babies are still preterm when we first see them in our our office. Their brains are more like the 35 weaker on the left with smooth gyri than the 40 weaker on the right with greater gyration and that tightly compacted walnut appearance. When I first saw this image, I started to really understand that indeed these babies are immature and need time to gain the skills to become competent breastfeeders. The post discharge newborn exam for breast milk fed infant needs to not only focus on the infant's medical history and well-being, but should also include a careful assessment of mother's health and, and a determination of risk factors for suboptimal breastfeeding. Observation of a breastfeeding is strongly encouraged. Most of the mothers and infants I see have had an excellent breastfeeding support in the hospital. However, the breastfeeding situation often changes in the hours after discharge. Mothers may now have full breasts, making latching more difficult and or have trauma to their nipples, or have a delay even in lactogenesis too. The mother should be provided help in supporting her infant to get a deep latch and to maintain that latch. I have listed a number of factors on this slide that can be helpful, but what really isn't shown is in the picture is a semi-reclining uh, position that I think can be very helpful in preventing the baby from falling or popping off the nipple and also allows the mother to relax. Test weights can be helpful as observation alone is not a reliable predictor of milk transfer in these infants. These infants need more frequent outpatient visits to ensure appropriate growth and sort through the breastfeeding challenges. 
phone follow-up and or collaboration with a lactation specialist who works with preterm infants is another option. I strongly encourage plotting growth parameters on an appropriate graph for preterm infants. I like the Fenton, but there are others. In addition, these infants also um, need iron in addition to vitamin D, as their iron stores are roughly 40% of what a full-term infant has at birth and are at risk of developing iron deficiency. Now I want to take just a moment to look at the mother specifically. A number of studies have been published in the last several years um, that have uh, detailed the challenges they face in breastfeeding late preterm infants. And this is an amazing qualitative study that tracks the breastfeeding course of 10 mothers of late preterm infants over the first six to seven weeks of life. And the title really says it all, weighing worth against uncertain work, the interplay of exhaustion, ambiguity, hope, and disappointment in mothers breastfeeding late preterm infants. The authors concluded that these mothers experienced a complex, tenuous process in flux. And some of the mothers overcame initial breastfeeding mismanagement and were successful in breastfeeding. Another group uh, did not overcome this mismanagement and ceased breastfeeding by six to seven weeks of age. And lastly, there was a group that did experience proper management and again were successful. I find this pilot study completed by Dr. Mayer helpful in setting expectations and realistic goals for family. This was a study of 24 mothers of preterm infants who were discharged at 36 weeks. And it should be noted they all had a full milk supply at that time. As seen in the graph, each week the infants got a little more at the breast as seen in the blue column with a concomitant reduction in the amount taken in the bottle as seen in the red column. And it was not until they were approximately two weeks past their due date or six weeks of age and actually two weeks past what is shown on the graph until they were competent to transfer full feeds. Somewhat surprisingly, when I provide mothers with this information, they usually look at me and say, I think I can continue to do this for a few more weeks. Now I realize this is a time-consuming and labor-intensive process. And again, it, it's weeks, not a few days, that we're asking mothers to do this. But with this in mind, I sometimes suggest mothers only put the babies to the breast three or four times a day for brief breastfeeding sessions, especially if the mothers seem overwhelmed. And I consider this practice at the breast. As they become more mature and have more stamina, I suggest that the mothers then step up the direct breastfeeding uh, when she is able to do so and work on a plan together to allow for more direct breastfeeding in longer periods of time at the breast with each session. I will often liken this period of time as going to breastfeeding school for our infant. Hopefully by the time the infant is two to three weeks past their due date, as was the case in the study I just showed you, they will be transferring full feeds. The mother can then roll back pumping, and I suggest that she roll back pumping gradually, dropping one session every two to four days, so as not to lose milk volume while the infant is still uh, transitioning to full feeds. Of course, not every infant will follow this trajectory, and if mothers do not have a full milk supply, the outcome will not match this study. I do think, though, it remains a helpful framework to keep in mind. Almost all preterm infants need extra breastfeeding support, even um, after discharge. We should aim to prevent common problems. Uh, we need to work with families to individualize a plan that works for them. I sometimes need to ask the family if the plan I have suggested is doable. These babies often need more time and more visits than the routine newborn checks. And lastly, we need research to understand better how to help the late preterm infant and their mother and their families transition to direct breastfeeding and address maternal milk supply issues. I want to thank everyone at, our, um, at UCSD who helps with taking care of these uh, late preterm infants. Mm -hmm.